Good morning. This is take two of our worship service today. Um, we're not going to have the full worship service, but we had a problem this morning with our sound. We got some new equipment in, and uh, somehow or other, the equipment wasn't calibrated with all of our microphones and whatnot, and so it had a lot of static. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just replay, redo my sermon this morning, uh, uh, which is aptly titled, Claiming a Faith That Stands Strong in Hard Times. And uh, we had a little bit of a hard time this morning. So as we begin our sermon, uh, I want to just remind you that this is part of a three-week series on faith, hope, and love. Last week I talked about hope. And I like this meme on hope that my neighbor Michelle posted on Facebook. It says, if you carry only one thing throughout your entire life, let it be hope. Let it be hope that better things are always ahead. Let it be hope that you can get through even the toughest of times. Let it be hope that you are stronger than any challenge that comes your way. Let it be hope that you are exactly where you are meant to be right now and that you are on the path to where you are meant to be because during these times, hope will be the very thing that you carries you through. If hope is the thing that carries you through, it is faith that is the vehicle. I'd like to suggest that it is our faith that undergirds our hope and allows us to believe that hope will prevail. Faith is a powerful force. It allows us to believe even when we don't yet see. That's why Jesus told the disciple Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. To hold on to faith before it's made evident brings peace that passes all understanding. It is to know that God is good and that he will deliver on his promises. In our morning worship service this morning, we sang, Standing on the Promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. The prophet Habakkuk understood the nature of faith. His book of prophecy is only three chapters long, 56 verses in all. But it follows the prophet from a period of deep concern to one of confidence and assurance. Even though this little book opens in gloom, it closes in glory. It begins with a question mark, but ends with an exclamation point. In chapter 2, we have the great declaration, which is echoed in the books of the New Testament at least three times, if not more. The just shall live by faith. Who was Habakkuk? Four things stand out. He was a man with problems. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of faith. And he was a man of song. If you open up to the third chapter, the final chapter of his prophecy, you will see this beautiful, beautiful prayer which comes across as a beautiful song. Habakkuk lived 600 years before Jesus. He lived during a time of a national crisis not unlike what we're going through today. Good King Josiah had been slain on the battlefield soon after Jehoiakim became king, and he was just an evil, bad man. In addition, the threat of war loomed as Babylon drew near, and it was devouring country after country. No wonder Habakkuk had his doubts and worries. He didn't think, didn't know, what the future would hold. The future looked, un looked bleak and uncertain. And there were probably moments where Habakkuk, like you and I, wondered, does God really care? Listen to his words. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? I cry out to you of violence and you will not spare us. In chapters 1 and 2, we see Habakkuk pouring out his complaints before God. Habakkuk wanted to know, just like some of us today want to know, when God will step in and make things right. 
I don't know about you, but I keep wishing that this coronavirus would go away. I echo President's hope that one day it will just disappear. Now, I know it, it probably won't happen on its own, but I keep hoping that God will make a way. To his plea, God answered Habakkuk, I'm going to do a work in your day that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians to restore order in the land. Now, you have to understand just how ironic this is. One of the causes of his great fear was that the Babylonians were going to come in and devour the land and destroy the people. But God says, they will be the instrument of your salvation. God often brings about the changes that we need in ways we cannot imagine. Faith tells us to wait on God, to trust him to deliver in his promises. Don't put your trust in the government, in the scientists, in a vaccine or anything else, waiting and hoping that that might come about. It may very well be one of these things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that testing, the vaccine, and the whole approach to safe practices won't help. It will, and it may be the way that God ends this virus. But God is not bound by these things. The answer may come through a source that no one ever thought of. It was this understanding that led Habakkuk to sing this hymn of faith in chapter 3. Habakkuk decides that he will trust the great God, the one who performed awesome deeds in the past on Mount Sinai and the Red Sea, and would again display the awesomeness of his divine might. In late February, the world was caught off guard when a virus began shutting down one country after another. By the middle of March, it was beginning to have a serious impact on our nation. I remember March 8th was the last regular service we had here in church. It was a great service. The sanctuary was filled. We had visitors. We had our regulars. The choir sang. It was beautiful. And then that week, we had a funeral service for Sandy Christina to a packed house. And we had not yet really began to understand the nature of this virus. But by March 15th, Already things were showing signs that things were going to be shut down. I think we had 25 people in worship that day. And uh, many others stayed home because they were waiting to see what we were called to do. Before long, life as we knew it changed. And everything was shut down. We had a stay-at-home order in place. And only the most essential services were still allowed to operate. The hospital was in full red alert mode. In life, things don't always go according to plan. Catastrophic circumstances, tumultuous times, perilous predicaments arrest our attention as they cut across the landscape of our lives. I was reading an article in Newsweek magazine that talked about the graduating class of 2020. I know that this is a tough time for our graduates. No in-person graduation services. You go all through your, your high school years or your college years and, and you look forward to walking across that stage and having your parents and your family cheer you on. And, and it's sad because every, every school has had to change things. But these kids who are graduating high school and college this year, they've seen so many things uh, from 9-11 to the financial crash of 08 and 09, to various flus and epidemics, to school shootings and devastating hurricanes like Sandy or Katrina. As I thought about that, it struck me though that almost every generation has faced a series of cataclysmic events from wars and world wars to natural disasters to terrible, terrible mishaps. That's just part of life, the kind of life that Habakkuk was living in his time and the kind that we're living right now. So what do we do? Well, we take it from Habakkuk. He says, just keep on living, keep on walking, keep on talking. The worst does come. There are bumps in the road. There are detours ahead. There are problems that we will go through. 
And while our problems today are not precisely the same as they were in Habakkuk's day, there is a definitive parallel. These are turbulent and uncertain times, just like he faced. Someone said that if Moses were to come down from Mount Sinai today with two tablets, instead of those being made of stone, they would be excedrin. Because what a headache we are living through. You know, it isn't always just the large, giant problems that destroy us. Sometimes it's the subtle forces that drain away our happiness and spoil our effectiveness. My daughter, my youngest daughter lives in Colorado, and so whenever I see something that, that speaks of Colorado, I, I, my, my ears open up, my eyes open up, and I saw this article uh, that on the slope of Long's Peak in Colorado, there lies the ruins of a huge tree. The naturalists say it stood for over 400 years, and it was massive. It had weathered thousands of storms and had been hit by lightning at least 14 times. And at the end, though, it wasn't these great disasters that fell the tree. It was an army of beetles that attacked it and leveled it to the ground. And these beetles were, were so small that you could hold them between your thumb and your forefinger. And it was these small things that took the tree down. You know, many people survive rare storms and lightning blasts, but allow the small beetles of worry, fear, and stress, and the tensions of daily challenges destroy their happiness and effectiveness. It's interesting to note that out of the 773,692 words of the Bible, the word worry is not found. Worry is not part of God's vocabulary. The threefold rule of earth's wisest man, we read in the book of Proverbs, and this is what he says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. <clears throat> Habakkuk said to his generation and to ours, my plan for the worst of times is this. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, the olive crop fails and there's no food from the field, if the sheep are destroyed in a storm and there is no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice. Notice Habakkuk doesn't say, then I will rejoice in the Lord. He says, yet I will rejoice. All my friends are gone, yet I will rejoice. Lost my job, yet I will rejoice. My health fails, yet I will rejoice. You see, many things happen in our lives which become the cause of celebration, but never a pending calamity as was facing Israel. And certainly not this time in the age of the coronavirus. I can't say that I wake up in the morning and jump up and down in joy saying, yay, guess what? The world is still shut down. We celebrate things like weddings and anniversaries and graduations and job promotions, the kind of things that aren't happening right now, but never defeat and destruction. Yet Habakkuk had the courage to celebrate and rejoice in the Lord that had been his past help and sustenance. He decided that he would put his faith in God, the one who had delivered him in the past. He would celebrate and praise God even in the difficult times. Sometimes as people of faith, we have to look around and find the reason to celebrate. We have to think about the goodness of Christ and all that he's done for us. You know, I, I've made it a, a, a big thing. My friend uh, who uh, really helped me out with my Mustang convertible, whenever I'm having a bad day, I get in the Mustang convertible and I go for a ride. Put the top down, doesn't matter if it's 30 degrees or 80 degrees, and I just ride, ride along the beach, ride along the shore, ride into the countryside. And over these last eight weeks, even though the weather hasn't always cooperated, on those tough times, I get in the car and I just thank God. I thank God not just for the car, but for his presence, for his blessings, and for the gifts that I've had in my life. 
You see, we have to look beyond the temporary setbacks and see the permanent love and faithfulness of our Almighty God. Here's the good news. God is no stranger to these crises, especially ones of magnitude like we're facing now or that Habakkuk faced. The same God who moved in history is involved in this present hour. God is able to handle this crisis that we're in the midst of. My faith tells me that challenges may reign for a time. Satan may get up and dance. But there's a God who rules above with a hand of power and a heart of love. And if I'm right, God will fight this battle and we will come out more than victors on the other side. God will allow you and me to rise above our circumstances and overcome them if we look up to him. Habakkuk says to you and to me that it's a time to get up, to look up, to stand up, to straighten up, and to speak up. Not in my name or your name, but in the name of the one who was at his best when we are at our worst. We must keep on rejoicing and believing that God is still in control. God is going to work things out in our homes, in our communities, in the various situations. We must delight ourselves in the Lord and he shall bring it to pass. You see, that is what faith is all about. It is trusting, it is standing on the promises of God that he will deliver because he is the Lord and King. And he is the one who promised, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. So hold fast to that. Claim your faith today in the loving, gracious, wonderful, great big God that we all love and serve, the one who created us and all the world around us. For our hope is in him, and our faith tells us that he will deliver and set us free. Praise God. Thank you for listening today, and I pray that you know that you are with God and that God has blessed you today. Amen. See you next time.